it's sure an honor for me to finally meet you, and I appreciate you taking some time for Oh, me. it's our privilege. We, One of the things we don't that, do a lot of these. We do some uh, try a few years not, not to get on the NAM magazines or the MMR and all that, so I ended up doing a few. But I told him, I said, now this is not going to be your typical story in Atlanta. This is about 87. I said, because I'm not going to say, yeah, we do these numbers and those numbers, and that's the way we do it, because I'm not giving away our trade secrets. But I'll tell you a little personal history about what goes on in my family and stuff, so it was, it was funny. And I got a lot of calling people said that was the funniest interview we've ever read in our life, and it, it was nothing about business. You know? <laughs> uh, well, that's part of the fun. I mean, there's a lot of characters, and there's certainly a lot of passion in this industry, isn't there? Oh, there is. Yes. That's Everybody's cool. in it. Everybody that's in it loves it, I and mean, it's like right. drugs. You know, it gets in your system. Yeah. And you got to do it every day. So I play piano and guitar, and used to play professionally when I was young. And, and Mac Davis and people like that outline, we always used to play together. And Char uh, Ronnie Millsap and um, my, my buddy. Ray Stevens. Who? Yeah, Ray, Ray Stevens. Stevens. Oh, yeah. I went to high school together and all that stuff. But we played all together. And as, when I went into business, um, I had to give up the plan, you know. I kept doing it for a while on weekends. And so I retired like uh, in 97. I sold out to Guitar Center. And, so I've been able to do a lot of practicing, so I finally got my chops kind of back up. And we play three or four nights a week around Atlanta and then Florida where our house is in Sarasota. Oh, yeah. So we have a lot of fun with it, but I play three or four hours a day. It's so much fun. I love playing and just being with musicians. Yeah. Oh, um, Mr. Luther, I wonder if you could tell me... Um, a little bit about your own family background. Did you have a lot of music in your house when you were growing up? Uh, my mother and my dad um, met in a high school band in Beckley, West Virginia, and back in about 1927, 28, and she played clarinet, he played trumpet in high school band, and they got married when they were 19 years old out of high school. and. Uh, they really never pursued it. My dad went with F.W. Woolworth Company and made a career out of that and stayed with the company for 40 some years and ended up in New York, retired in Atlanta. But in his moving around, we ended up settling in Atlanta. And uh, I started piano when I was six years old. And when you're six years old, you don't, underst you don't understand what a three quarter note is because you haven't had any math. So uh, I stuck with it for about a year, but you know, you can't really get the basics unless you're maybe oriental and they can do it when they're three years old. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I had to quit. And when I was nine years old or 10 years old, my sister had decided she wanted to take up the piano. And uh, my parents said, no, you didn't take, do anything with it when you were six, so you can't take anymore. So I used to make my sister show me what she learned when she started. And so they saw I was really interested in it for about a year and so they let me start back, and uh, I actually started back in the fifth grade book, and the uh, fifth year book, whatever it was. And so they saw it really interesting. So I took for a couple of years, and finally the teacher said, hey, you're gonna have to get a different teacher. You know more than I do. But So I kind of took off on my own then, you know. I played, uh, I tr started trumpet when I was nine, and I played uh, trumpet in high school and then the orchestra in Johnson City, Tennessee, and, and played, and I took up sax when I was 12, and if my dad would get transferred around, if they didn't need a trumpet player in the band, I, I would uh, audition with saxophone. So I would play saxophone in the band. <laughs> so I ended up uh, in uh, Atlanta in 1950, I was 15 years old. I played trumpet with, uh, um, um, Big band when I was 15 years old in Washington, D.C. one summer. And uh, um, Pastor, Tony Pastor band, 18 piece band. I'm sure. And the way I got hold of that job was uh, my teacher was living in Johnson City, my trumpet teacher. And he wanted me to try out, and they were going to, they just brought the core of the band there, about four members uh, Tony Pastor and his brother Stubby, who was a trumpet player and wrote all the scores of the music. And, um, so my teacher was like 27 or 8 years old, and he said, George, I want you to try out for the uh, Tony Pastor Band. He's coming here for New Year's Eve, and I think you can, you can do it. I said, no, I can't do that. You, old man, I'm 15 years old. 
He said, I want you to do it. So I tried out and got hired as second trumpet. And he had four trumpet players, you know, four trombones, five saxes, and the whole big band thing. So uh, that summer, um, I got to play with him in uh, Washington, D.C. at Shore Motown. We played for ex-president Hoover and J. Edgar Hoover's birthday and all this stuff. So I cut it, kind of cut my teeth there on the professional end of it and uh, played through high school. And I was always playing piano on the side for my own amazement and uh, got some old rock and roll bands together back in high school days and formed my own band in college. I went to Emory University in Atlanta. They had no music program. So we played a lot of fraternity parties and I ended up playing a lot of restaurants and cocktail bars and things and kind of worked my way through college and saved money. And my first wife and I, and she died like seven years ago. And uh, when we got married, at, I was 21, she was 19. And uh, we sat down and agreed that we're going to save fifty thousand dollars. And I was going to school. I was working in the afternoon, and I was playing at night. And she was working. All right, we lived on a budget of ten dollars a week. And when we saved fifty thousand dollars, we were going to go into business. Now, I never thought about the music business because I was playing on weekends and things. But I never thought about the retail. But I had been working in a discount house, like service merchandise and all the big discounters, when I was in college, also. So I decided to uh, save $50,000 in five years. So I opened up my first store in 1961. And we had 50000 which gave me a $100,000 line of credit at the bank. 61, that was a lot of money. So um, we opened up and uh, still worked on the budget. And I played weekends. She kept her job for five years. We put every dime back into the business. And we were very fortunate. And the business kind of took off from the first day we opened and moved to our second location about two years later across the street in Buckhead, North Atlanta business area. And then we bought a big building down at the end of the block in 1967. It used to be a J.C. Penney uh, store and then it was the Bell South North Atlanta office. And remodeled that building and bought the one next door and opened up our first kind of superstore. And we called it Rhythm City, R-H-Y-T-H-M City. And uh, we were just very fortunate, you know, and got all the lines. And I paid cash as I went. And everybody said, oh, we can give you credit. And I was one of the first ones to get the Gibson franchise in 1961, 62. And uh, they hadn't opened up Gibson franchise in years in Atlanta. There was a company called Ritter Music down on Auburn Avenue downtown. They had it since like 1898. And they could, you couldn't break that franchise. And Gibson at that time used to just have one uh, franchise in a city, you know. I was able to get the franchise and um, paid the bills on the invoice date and I kind of got in that happy and happy habit and uh, because of that I was able to over the years obtain better, you know, more lines like Fender and all the big stuff and move down to the bigger store and carry that with me and as my volume grew and I did a lot of advertising and kept pouring the money back into the business it all worked out great for me, and then I was very fortunate because the Beatles came on the scene, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and folk music came on the scene, uh, 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 Elvis Presley came on the scene, rock and roll, you know, everything just happened, and you could not get enough merchandise to sell. It didn't matter how much you ordered, because I was always like, give me one of those, give me two of those, three of those, and they say, man, you ought to buy six of them. One of the biggest influences on me was working in the discount house, like the service merchandise one in Atlanta called the Tuxedo Mart, M-A-R-T. And uh, they had a code, I'm going to reveal it to you, it was T-U-X-E-D-O-M-A-R-T, because there was two T's in Tuxedo Mart. So we had the code for our cost code on every product and we discounted 30, 40%, you know, razors and luggage and watches and rings and cameras and you know, furniture, just all that stuff. And I really liked that discount business. And I said, when I open up music, I want a discount because nobody discounted. So I probably opened up one of the first discount stores in the country. And uh, that brought everybody in and, and it worked. So uh, I was always considered a discounter. And, you know, if the manufacturer said, don't do that, okay. You know, <laughs> I try not to do it. But as my numbers grew, you know, they, kind of liked the volume and 
they kind of turned their heads and said, well, do it discreetly. Don't be so out there with it, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, we started expanding and we opened up another store in 85 and we opened up a huge store in 80, you know, uh, 85 and 91, we opened up a store in uh, Smyrna. And uh, we called that store American Music, later called it American Discount Music and built the store and the warehouse on the back, et cetera. And uh, we ended up with four or five stores in the area. And they all had different names. And somebody said, why don't you just call them all Rhythm City? You've already got that name established. I said, because if they come in our store and they can't find what they're looking for and they pass another Rhythm City, they're just gonna assume that they can't find it there either, right? It's like going past a radio shack. So they'll say, oh, here's another music store. Maybe they've got it. And they go, and we'll get another shot of them. So we had a real good close rate. I figured 95, 98% of everybody that came in our store would be sold. And we would not let anybody walk out the door without selling them something or getting a deposit on something, you know, because we were there to sell, but we made it fun. And a lot of human stories go along over the years with the crazy things that we did. And the company grew. and. We kept expanding. Um, now, was the first store that you opened uh, Rhythm City? Or? Rhythm City, R-H-Y-T-H-M City. And I actually had a partner for about six months when I first opened up, and I didn't invest a lot of my money into it, just a small amount, and I wanted to see if I could work with him, and I found that I couldn't, and he was originally a band director, and so I bought his part out, and when we opened up, uh, I said, what do you want to name the store? And he said, I want to name it Rhythm City. He was an old friend of mine, he used to be my band director. And uh, he said, Rhythm City, I like drums. I said, well, it makes it sound like a drum shop and I really want to sell everything. He said, well, I like that name Rhythm City, R-H-Y-T, Rhythm City. I said, whatever, you know, I think we'll make it fly. I don't think there's a whole lot in the name is what you do with it. So. Uh, it really sounded like a drum store, you know. And over the years, we overcame all that, and we sold pro audio and everything, or studio gear and everything. But there was a young boy that worked for me, you know, back in about '69 when we ended up with our big store, Buckhead. And he said, "Mr. Luther," he says, "You like this name, Rhythm City?" I said, "I can't stand it," but you know. We've been using it now for seven years and we're going to stick it with it. We're not going to switch. He said, well, if you had to rename it, what would you call it? And I said, um, I would call it Atlanta Discount Music. He said, well, why would you call it that? And I said, well, it tells us where you're located, what you sell, and how much you sell it for. Well, he grew up and when he was about 19, 20 years old, he opened up a consignment music store because he didn't have any money. People bring their stuff and then he would sell it for me and he became pretty successful. And you know what he called the store? Atlanta Discount Music. <laughs> and it worked great for him, you know, because just the name when you go in the advertising, Atlanta Discount Music, you know, you say Rhythm City, you think drums. So I always had to put big display ads in the old pages with PA systems and keyboards and everything and a little drum down in the corner. <laughs> so, uh, so what were the name of the other five stores? Uh, we had uh, American Music, and then we had American Discount Music, and we had National Music and National Discount Music. <laughs> and uh, we had five warehouse locations that weren't connected to our stores. And we had a large inventory, I mean large. And we tried to have everything for everybody. I tried to be one of those guys, I was doing everything to everybody. I finally learned you can't do that, you know. And I think when Guitar Center bought me out, um, they thought I probably had 13, 14,000 different items because that's about what they had. And uh, after they did inventory, I said, my gosh, you have over 16,000 different items in stock. Now, I mean, some of them weren't in depth, but some of them were, you know. And we kept a large stock of Fender guitars. We didn't have. 1,000, 2,000 Fender guitars, same thing with Gibson. We'd have a couple, two, three hundred Martins in stock. We just kept a large inventory. People learned that they could come to our store and find what they wanted. And uh, we had every brand, every major brand, and we gave them a good deal. And uh, we negotiated on the prices. So we'd get 
anywhere from the top to the bottom. <laughs> At the end of the week, we'd add up and say we made any money, and we usually came out all right. So uh, I had people start coming in to want to buy me out in '94. It started, and uh, one of them, I think, was '95. He came in it was Mark Begelman, who used to own all the office depots. And Mark was a nice guy. Started in California with, you know, working in a, a, a office supply place and opened up on a little store one and two and four and five and merged, et cetera, and got control of the company and got nationally big. You know the story. Mark's a pretty good guitar player, and so uh, he sold his business in I think '91 or two and moved to Fort Lauderdale, big house, big ship. I think he went around the earth a time or two and got bored. So he decided he was going to go into boat building business. And he was a young man then, 42, 3, 4. But he was going to go into musical instrument business because he played guitar. So he came and tried to buy me out. And he was probably one of the first that opened the door. People started wanting to come, I hear you for sale. He said, no, I'm not for sale. I mean, I'm doing great. I don't want to sell. You know? And we would always tease with the Guitar Center guys when we go to the shows and beat them. And we always got along great. And, Friends of mine were like Chuck Levin at Washington Music and Ash Boys in New York and Manny's and, and you know, Freddie down at Ace Music in Miami. So we all kind of hung together, big dealers, you know, when, we, when I finally got that size. And I always had a ball with them, you know. So uh, Mark, he made me an offer and said, Mark, I'd love to sell to you, son, but I'm just not for sale, <laughs> you know. so. He ended up opening uh, Mars, which is music and recording superstores. And uh, he bought out Freddie in Miami. And that was probably in 95 or 6, something like that. And then he, that was Ace Music. And then they closed those up with the Mars name. And, and he did very well. He opened 60, 70, 80 stores. And, but it was, it's a tough business to go into if you don't have 10, 20, 30 years behind you and no one wants to do. So I told Mark, I said, Mark, uh, where are you going to get your employees? He said, I'm going to run a job fair. He said, I'll get all these guys from high five buys, dust buys, and Circuit City play. I said, they don't know anything about the music business. They're box locker kids. You know, not, nothing wrong with it, but, you know, they're there six weeks and they're gone, and it's more home, or, uh, home consumer goods. No problem, he said. I said, well, now the guys I hire, they all play and they're all professional. And it's a little problem in getting the good help in the music business because you got to have a guy that plays. you got to have a guy that's going to stay with you because they all want to be a star and get on the road and they don't want to stay around for years. you got to have a guy's personality and you have a guy that's money motivated. The more you pay him, the more longer he'll stay around. And, you know, just a guy that will, a leader, you know. So we developed that over a long period of time and we had a lot of great employees. And uh, you know, like our guitar managers and keyboard managers, and, and we had a bunch of employees, and any one of them could have managed the store. So after Guitar Center did buy me up in '97, and that was about a year process and a lot of fun, they said, George, we didn't realize that every one of the guys that worked for you could manage the store. So we came out with more than we thought because we're looking for store managers, and all your guys are high, so highly qualified because they're like 10, 15, 20, 25 years in the business, you know. But one of the problems I used to have, and I paid my guys great money, and uh, uh, if they would want to leave, I would say, let me give you another 100 a week or 50 a week, or whatever I thought would keep them, you know. Go buy yourself a house, a nice car, and a boat, and a motor home, and all. Get deep in debt. I didn't say that then, but I think that. And you can't afford to quit and have all this money you owe every month without making a lot of money. So that worked for me, and I had guys work for me 20, 25, 30 years, and all great players, professional musicians. And uh, one of the problems I used to have was we had a lot of groups coming through, professional groups, you know, and years ago, back in the 70s, I built cabinets for the Beatles and all that stuff. And we ended up with a, pro a professional division, and they would stop by the store in their tour buses and their equipment buses and buy equipment traveling, you know, a lot of the country groups from Nashville and rock groups. And uh, I'd be looking around for one of my key guys, maybe he'd been there five, eight, ten, twelve years now. I'd look around one or two o'clock in the afternoon and say, where's so-and-so? Where's so 
oh, you didn't know so-and-so got on the bus and left with the band. What? I said, yeah, they wanted to ask him how much he was making. They were so impressed with his technical knowledge of what was going on, they'd say, we need a tech, and we'll just double what you're making. And if you'll get on the bus and go with them. And I lost a lot of guys that way. And most of them would come back and knock on my door. You're too late. Say, George, <laughs> we're sorry. Uh, we want our job back, you know. And it was like, okay, I was I need to help so bad. And I like love these guys anyway. I'd usually thank them back, but if they did it to me more than five, six times, I had to scratch my head. I had the one who did it to me the most. I hired him back 23 times over the years. And so uh, it got where I was always needing help because we were all expanding, looking for the pro guy, and these guys knew the stuff. So I was like, you know, I really want to hire this guy back, but I'm going to, I've got this guy in training. I'd always have my 10 guys in the keyboard department, and 10 in the guitar department, and all this stuff, and, and the band is this, and this. Anyway, I got where I had a little card printed up. It would say, I will pay Ricky Thompson, who was my warehouse manager, and a great guy. He's now the Larrabee sales manager. Travels all over the United States and Canada with his sons on. A great guy. I put him in my wheel. <laughs> he worked for me for many, many years. And the only guy, one of the few guys that had keys to my store and my house and everything. <laughs> and uh, put him in my will. And uh, so I told Ricky, I said, Ricky, I'm writing this card. I will pay, and I'd fill in the blank, Ricky Thompson, and that had a blank, so many thousand dollars, like 5,000 or 10,000, 50,000, if I ever hire so-and-so back and sign it. I said, I put this in your wallet and I date it, and if I ever hire this guy back, I'm gonna have to give you $50,000 or 10,000, whatever. And Ricky had a whole pocket full of cards. <laughs> so these guys would come back and knock on the door, George, can I get my job back? I said, no, man, you, we had a term called signing, S-O-N-I-N-G, signing was like, you know, messing with me, you know. Son, I mean, the term kind of caught on in the music industry, and that's another story. And, uh, and uh, I said, these guys are signing me, you know. So any Rick, anyway, I, Ricky had a whole pocket full of cards, so a guy come back and knock on the door and said, George, I like my job back. I said, well, I really want to hire you back, but Ricky's got a card on you. And they said, well, can you get it back from Ricky? I said, I think Ricky would hold to me. I'll call him back and ask him. So I'd call him back from the warehouse. Ricky, here's Joe Blow. He wants to go to back to workforce. I know you got a $50,000 card on this guy, Ricky. Uh, and I could really use him back. Um, can we work out something on that card? He said, George, I really know you need him. He said, you know, you don't owe me anything. Hire him back. So I'd give him $500 or 100 to bump him something. <laughs> But it was my insurance policy that I wouldn't take these guys back, you know, because I was getting so exhausted with it, you know. And a lot of them are going to be at our little get-together tomorrow night who have done this to me, and they know who they are. And, but we're still friends, you know, because I appreciate the fact that uh, musicians like to get with big groups and travel, and you see them on TV. And, you know, I sold a lot of them their first equipment, like Travis Tritt, and just tons of them, first guitar, and all these guys, you know, when they're young. But, uh, Do you I have a Beatles I, story? Uh, Beatles' uh, road manager was a um, good-looking black gentleman, great guy, trombone player, professional, lived in Macon, Georgia. And he used to come in and buy uh, um, equipment from us and um, for the Beatles. And so he hired our company, I think it was back in the 70s, early 70s, somewhere in there. And he wanted us to build, I think it was 36 outdoor speaker cabinets for him. And they had their own speakers, or we got them, I can't remember the exact transaction, but I didn't know we got the, and that was for their Japanese tour. And uh, everybody knows the story, they went to Japan, and uh, they got arrested for possession of marijuana. And the word was, and I don't know if it's true or not, but the marijuana was between the speakers and the cabinets. <laughs> and back in those days, everybody said they will be in the Japanese slammer for 25 to 50 years, you know. And uh, somehow they wiggled out of it, and I don't know if they said we didn't know what was going on, maybe it was some of our road crew or what was going on, you know. But that was kind of a Beatles story. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I guess I rubbed elbows with about everybody professionally in the business one time or another. 
because of our proximity to Nashville. And um, um, I just knew them all. And uh, poor Nashville, they got 8% sales tax. And if you ship out of state, you didn't have to charge them anything. So they'd come to Atlanta and select a big PA system or sound equipment or studio. And we'd deliver it up here and, or you know, by a common carrier. They wouldn't have to pay any sales tax. So I already had the dealers in Nashville beat by 8%. Plus, I would give them a better price. It was very difficult for them to compete, and I had every, all the lines. I had Tascam and everything major you could think of, and, and um, I was doing a great business in Nashville. I never had a store presence here, though. So uh, I remember at one point, the state of Nashville so it sent me a letter said, uh, Mr. Luther, uh, concerning your state sales tax for Tennessee, you haven't been paying it. And I wrote him back and said, I don't have to pay it. I'm exempt because Congress has maintained that uh, shipping out of state, you don't have to pay sales tax to that state. And they finally passed a law that said, unless you have a presence in that state. In other words, if I had a physical building in Tennessee, then I would have to pay them. And so we went through that uh, uh, little dialogue with the state. And then they wrote back and said, but you do have a big ad in the Yellow Pages. So you have a presence. So we checked it out, you know, with our attorneys. I said, but we don't have a physical presence. We just have an ad. And then they came in and said, but you're paying for a lot of money for this ad every month. And so then I had come up with a little uh, experience with the telephone company and found out over the years, because I advertised in Dallas and Houston and LA and Chicago and New York and everywhere in the Yellow Pages. Picked all the big cities. and. Did a lot of national advertising, and uh, I found that the telephone company will negotiate with you if you do a lot of business with them. So I would say, well, for example, something like this: I'll buy Jacksonville Yellow Pages, but I want you to give me Nashville Yellow Pages free. So that would be a free ad. I'll buy Charlotte, North Carolina. I want New Orleans free. You know? Okay. So over the years, this all worked out. So I checked the. Tennessee, and sure enough, I was paying nothing. It was a free ad, <laughs> you know, kind of like a perk. So uh, they didn't ever answer me after that, you know. <laughs> but I do understand that uh, Tennessee went after um, um, they went after somebody big time, and um, uh, I'm trying to think if it was Pat Boone or if it was a gospel group or who it was. I can't remember in California. Mm who was uh, selling uh, CDs and all, and they wanted sales tax in those other states. This is before the days of internet. And uh, they ended up paying, I've forgotten exactly what the situation was, but that was the little battle I fought the whole time I was in business. And the issue would always come up. There was a new bill before Congress that you're gonna have to pay the sales tax of the state you ship to, and then it came up, well, local option taxes, not everybody pays the same tax. You'd have to hire 100 mathematicians to know, and you'd have to hire 100 bookkeepers to pay the sales tax and do all the free in this county, this county, this county, and all that. So uh, Congress just never passed that law, and it's still the law, I think, that if you ship out of state and don't have a presence in that state, so far, you don't have to pay any sales tax. So that was another way we were able to get our mail order end of it going real big. And, I think I started the mail order business in 1969. It was not looked upon favorably in the music industry, but you know, we got slapped on the wrist a lot, but it didn't hurt. We just brushed it off and kept going. I kept mailing. <laughs> and then the internet comes along later, you know, and, and I had pretty much gotten out of it by that time. I was in the internet and uh, websites and all in its infancy. And I saw it was going to be a tough road to hoe. And when Guitar Center came in, wanted to buy me out, we negotiated what I thought was a wonderful price. Thank you very much, Guitar Center. <laughs> I love you guys. You made my life wonderful. <laughs> so uh, they bought me out. And uh, with the internet sales and everything, the music industry now, it's tough. It's tough because everybody's got a web page, thousands of them. And the guy can be working out of a bedroom, and he's got a website this big, and it looks like he's a city block big dealer, you know. 
and uh, he's selling it for a 2% markup or 5% because he's just got a one bedroom apartment or whatever, you know. So it's really been rough uh, for all the music industry, you know, to kind of maintain what used to go on years ago, you know, which big dealers, medium dealers, small dealer. Mm -hmm. And now it's like it all kind of got equalized because Nobody knew what a big dealer was, but brick and mortar stores still are the anchor in the rock, you know. So I feel sorry for all of them. <laughs> One of the things I think is interesting, and you, you were alluding to it, was the mail order catalog, because I think you were pretty much the first. I, I think I was industry. the first and one of the first. And was Sam other, Ash, was I think. Were there other industries that were having? I mean, how did you come up with the idea? And how, um, how did you? When I worked uh, at. Um, in college for um, Tuxedo Mart, which I told you was a local birds and family owned uh, uh, merchandise. Um, uh, um, they had their own catalog. And people would come in with their catalog where they mailed it out. Hey, this is great. You know, they'd come in, know what they want. And there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of mail order going on then, you know. And uh, um, that was like between 57 and 60, 61 of them. And, um, but it, the advertising pays off. But I spent many, many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of dollars wastefully, but it wasn't wasteful, it was a learning process. Because you gotta figure out what's gonna work and what doesn't work, what gets business, what doesn't get business. Am I wasting my money or could I spend it better over here? What product can I sell or push? And there's a lot to it. And um, I spent a lot of money on advertising where I got nothing out of it. And over a year or two later, I just dropped that part of the advertisement and go and try something new. I did television advertising, uh, newspaper advertising, mail outs, um, advertising, you know, the end user magazines like, you know, Guitar Player and all those, they were very good. I did venture into one new market that was very interesting. Uh, flying one time on Delta and I got the little Delta Frequent Flyer out and looked at it. I said, you know, I think I'm gonna try this. I've never tried the Frequent Flyer before. You got a captive audience, you know, and some of them probably play music or interested in music of some form, everybody is. So uh, when I went back to Atlanta, I got in touch with the Delta magazine people and I said, I want to put a big ad in the issue. They said, okay. And you want color or you want black and white? And I said, well, give me some prices. And I think I took out a black and white half page ad, if I remember correctly, it was going to be $12,000 for you know, one half page for one issue, which I think they come out with monthly. If one color is going to be about twice that, and this was like years ago. And uh, so I did it, and that really paid off for me. And I was getting calls from Europe and France and Saudi Arabia wanted me to put in their uh, sound system and their rail system they were building, things that I couldn't handle. You know, I mean, it's gonna be a 10-year project. I, if I could have handled it, I wouldn't have handled it, you know, because it's so turmoil, so much turmoil. But uh, now we turn it over to friends of mine in that industry, you know. and. Uh, it was pretty interesting. I actually got business off of that one ad probably for four or five years. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, wow. had I not sold that guitar center, I had planned to go in the frequent Flyer Delta and then go into United and all the other ones also, you know, one shot every year or two or something. A lot of exposure because those things are picked up by everybody and I'd get executives from Pittsburgh plate glass or anything is either come call me for public address systems for their convention meetings and things. Yeah, you know, that was great. <laughs> this won't pay for the ad, you know. So it was good advertising. And just a market you just wouldn't think of, you know. Mm. Kind of expensive to experiment with, but yeah, we did it anyway. <laughs> we broke all the rules. <laughs> Hey, tell me about your uh, playing career. How did you meet Ronnie Millsap and those guys? Um, Ronnie moved to Atlanta and was, uh, you know, Ronnie's blind. And he started going blind, I think, when he was about two years old. And he was being raised, I think, by his grandmother or aunt in South Carolina. And this family in um, Gainesville, Georgia, a little north of Atlanta, took him in as a teenager. And because they had a son who was a friend with him. 
and they met him and Ronnie been playing and and he used to come in my store and, and I'd run him uh, world of pianos and things like that back then you know and Ronnie would have uh, Lothridge was the boy's name Billy Lothridge his brother used to play football for Georgia Tech he went on to play in the NFL I think with the Bears or somebody and uh, the Lothridge family was a big name in the greater Atlanta area and they did paving did a lot of the interstate paving they had some a lot of, you know, a lot of money and uh, so they took Ronnie in and uh, you know and their son played guitar and he played guitar and they had other kids that played instruments and that's how we met. And a uh, real funny story, a um, bunch of the guys took Ronnie, brought Ronnie to Nashville because he was doing rock and roll, great. Ronnie's a great piano player, great pitch, great voice. He's still my favorite. And uh, so I hadn't seen Ronnie in quite a few years. And then uh, uh, a group got together and built a big uh, arena up at Lake Lanier, north of Atlanta, and it would seat about 10, 12,000 people. And I put their big, their first big PA system in up at Lake Lanier. And uh, uh, I had to go up there and show them how to run it and everything. So Ronnie was uh, the second weekend on the show. The first weekend was uh, um, Pat Boone and Debbie Boone, and they would do a show on Friday, and they'd do two shows on Saturday, and I'd have to take off and go up there and show the guys how to run the boards and everything. And uh, uh, um, Roy Clark, he was one of them. And anyway, Ronnie did a show up there, and I hadn't seen Ronnie in about five years. And I went one afternoon there, you know, doing rehearsal, sound checks, et cetera, and I hadn't seen Ronnie in five, six years. And I just walked up behind him, he was on the piano bench and on the stage, and I said, hey, Ronnie, how you doing? George, George, hey George, how you doing? You know, he said, I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> I said, buddy, how you doing? You know, it really excited me because he's so in tune with people's voices and things, you know. So yeah. I love him. He's one of my favorite uh, musicians. And, uh, you know, I just would rub elbows with people. You know, go back to the 60s. I saw Martin Luther King and a bunch, his, a bunch of guys came to the store with him, a Martin guitar back in the 60s for one of their first marches on Washington, D.C. and one of the civil rights marches. Okay. And later, as the years go by, and they have the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. Dexter, his son, had a nice big recording studio there and we were able to sell them all their equipment. And Dexter's a really fine guy. He runs the Martin Luther King Center. So I don't know, this thing just grows exponentially and you meet this guy that knows that guy, and you end up just playing, rubbing elbows with these guys, you know. And uh, so Martin Luther King actually came into the store himself. Uh, yeah, he came in, and he had five, six guys, and they all had the bib overalls and brogans, and they bought this guitar. And I said, "What are you guys doing?" You know, kind of the first time I'd seen him, you know. And I said, "Well, we're going to Washington D.C. tomorrow, and we're going to do a uh, march in Washington, you know, at the Washington Monument. I'm going to buy a guitar. Oh, great, you yeah. know." Yes, sir. <laughs> Glad to help you out here. So that's always been one of my favorite stories, you know. Yeah. And uh, they have a lot of them. A lot of them. A lot of the guys come to perform in Atlanta. They all came out to the store, and they buy equipment from us. And, and um, 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 Steve Wonder used to fly in and buy software. I, I had probably the biggest software department in the United States in the 70s. I had, I'd always be the first on the block with a new piece of software. It might be 2000 it might be $5,000. A month from the day, it might be $500, it might be $50, you know. But all these guys wanted to be the first with the new gear and the first sound. They'd fly in and spend a day or two with our pros, teach showing and stuff, and they'd buy it and go back and fly back. And I had guys used to fly in and buy a lot of stuff from us, you know, because they couldn't find it anywhere else. And an interesting story was um, um, when Tascam, I was a big Tascam deal, decided to quit making their two-inch machines. I think they were 32-track. Um, I found out they had, I forgot how many they had in stock. It was a lot, several dozens of them. And uh, I said, I'll take them all. They said, you will? They're going to just go digital, you know. So uh, I bought them all. I forgot there was a bunch of them, you know. And... Uh, so we were known to get big discounts. 
And uh, I just put them back in one of my warehouses and sat on them, you know, because I said, I know that studios, because I know all this works, they're going to need that analog sound one day. This digital sound is great, but it's real dry. So they're going to need this analog sound for the backup and digital for the singers or however they want to mix it. But you really need both. So people say, Luther, you're crazy, because I just paid for them, you know, a lot of money. And uh, so over the months, as everybody's inventory dried up for the two-inch, 32-track machines, I started getting calls and said, uh, Mr. Luther, we called Tascam, and they said that you're the only place that we could find a two-inch machine. We understand you have some stock. I said, yes, we'd be glad to help you out. And I would quote them retail price. And I was not known to sell anything retail. And they said, well, that's, can't you give me a discount? You're known to discount? I said, I'd love to, but you know what? These machines are going to be in demand, and these studios are going to find out you got to have it. But shop around if you can get a good deal on it. I would buy it. I wouldn't blame you, but you know, I still love you. And a week or two later, they come back the next day and said, George, will you still just sell me one <laughs> for less price? I said, sure, you know, and, uh, because nobody had them. So I kind of closed that market down on those machines for task game, you know. But so I always like to do that, you know. Something else I used to like to do. You know, I keep thinking of new things as we're speaking. I used to like get uh, Henry and Gibson guitars would make custom guitars for us to our specs. And if they liked our guitars, and that's a real important thing for dealers to know. You got to set guitars up when they come in from the manufacturer. They are not adjusted for great playability. You got to have the strings close, intonation right, the whole thing. We set our guitars up. They just play like butter, you know. And uh, you like my guitar? Uh, I love that guitar. That's the guitar I'm going to have. But I'm going to shop around. Okay, that's all right. Here's our price. Well, how about the discount? I said, that is the discounted price. It's really not the price on this. We had it custom built. And they would always come back and buy it if they fell in love with it because it was one of a kind, you know. And, uh, Did you have your own name on it? Uh, no, uh, we didn't. Uh, I have done importing and put different names on before and back in the days of Japan and Korea and that kind of thing. But uh, uh, it was, you know, it was custom built guitars and the color primarily and things like that and it was just like one of a kind type of things, you know. And that worked real well for us. Guitar Center does that type of thing, you know. And we had a vintage guitar department and we tried to do things a little different where it wasn't just anybody can get one, just be competitive, try to make your product a little different so it's the most desirable and they can't buy it anywhere else to be you know, we're still trying to cut them a good price on so make them happy. And uh, never will forget. <laughs> and you, you know, I get started. I'm sorry. I, I'll go on for ages. Um, and there was a the fellow who was the, one of the big writers, and he might have been associate editor, even editor of Rolling Stone magazine. He lived in Tampa. I won't mention his name because he's a good friend of mine. And uh, he loved Martin guitars. And I had a big selection. Well, Mark Guitars came shipped in a sealed vacuum pack, you know, in the case and all this. And, and people wanted to buy a Mark Guitar. They didn't want to buy one on the rack. They wanted one in the box. Okay, I've got them. I mean, you know, we keep a dozen or two D28s and a couple dozen D18s and D45s, whatever they want. But this particular guy, I'd let him open up boxes. And I'd let him open up three boxes and let him pick out the one he wanted because they all look at the grain of the guitar, you know, and he's a player and um, the hobbyist player. And I'd let him pick whatever, you know, and I gave him a great deal. I mean, a great deal, like 10 percent up or something. But he gave us great advertising, a lot of free advertising, et cetera, in Rolling Stone. So um, they came out with a uh, signature model on a Martin guitar by... Uh, Oh, what's this? Eric, Eric Clapton model, and I think they made 100 or 150, 200. And they were only going to sell, I think, one to a dealer, you know, however many they were making. And I happened to get two of them. I think I had serial number 052 or 053 or something. So Bill was always calling Martin up, what are you making, especially them? 
They told me Eric Clapton. Room said the guy said, you know, he's got two. So he flew up from Tampa. Hey, George, I want to buy one of those Eric Clapton's from you. I said, okay. I almost said his name. <laughs> I said, but you know what? I really don't want to open up the second one. It's just like take either one of them. They're both great. You know, I want to look at them. I said, okay. So I let him look at me. He's six one and one. And uh, I said, you know, I really would love to give you a great price. on I can't get them. I, I'm going to give you a great discount on it which I did, but I didn't give him this great price I always gave him. I said, because I can sell these price, these guitars at you know, MSRP and, and get the price, and I'm not trying to be greedy, and you've been great to us, but I'm going to still give you a great discount, and I want you to be happy. So he kind of grumbled a little bit. He said, okay, I'm happy, and he bought the one. So he called me back the next day from Tampa. He said, uh, George. He said, uh, my next door neighbor loves this guitar, and he wants to buy the other one you got. I said, okay, mm -hmm. but uh, I got to get a full pop for it. And he said, George, don't do that to me. He said, sell it to me the same price. You sold me mine. He's my next door neighbor for years. And I said, I'll split it and get in between the MSRP and what you paid him will sell it to your next door neighbor because I really don't want to sell it for that. So. He said, okay, so he flew up and got that for his neighbor. <laughs> uh, Martin's a guitar that people want in a unsealed. You know, I want one brand new in a box. You know, we, that's when we kept big inventories for things. You know, we could always go get them one out of the box, you know. And then we'd set it up for them, make it play good, you know, they were just happy with it. Sometimes they liked the floor model, you know. But particularly when you were shipping mail order or oh, yeah. whatever. Um, we always tried to give them one in the box, you know. We weren't, weren't schlocking boxes, but, you know. And we'd set it up real nice because we knew that setup's 90% of the game, you know. And we didn't want to see it coming back. And we always called and said, man, this thing plays great. I'm so happy with it. Uh, tell me about your amplifiers, you know. Oh, you're going to be happy with our amplifiers. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's just, you got to please the customer, you know. Yeah. I hear you have a Jimmy Carter story. Oh, yeah, that was a funny story. Um, in our Buckhead store, we moved in to our first big building in Buckhead, North Atlanta. Um, I had bought an 85 Corvette, and uh, this is 87. And uh, that store really was crowded with boxes to the ceiling, and it, you couldn't move in there, and we'd get packed in there. And, we had warehouses, we couldn't even get in the warehouse. So I told the guys one day, I said, look, um, um, we've got to tighten these boxes up in here. We can make a lot more room for a lot more product and show a lot more product. And I said, George, we can't make any more room in here. We're packed as tight as we can get. And my Corvette had to be sitting out front. And I said, I can get that Corvette through the door and put it right here in the front and still have this playroom. It will rearrange everything. And they really didn't want to do it, you know, they didn't want to work. So I bet uh, one of my assistant managers $500 so that I could put the Corvette through the front door. So he said, you got a bet. So my warehouse manager, which the warehouse was about 10, 15 miles away, and one of them had about five warehouses. I said, Ricky, uh, go measure that door and see if my Corvette would go through. It was a double door, you know. And he went, can we see? Yeah, it'll go through there. Well, he didn't realize that on each side you lose about three or four inches when those doors swing open. So Buckhead kind of became a Bourbon Street bar area over the years. And Friday and Saturday night, it was like everybody walking the streets and everything, you know. So the bar owner across the street had a real popular one, bands, everybody had live bands. And he heard that I was going to put the Corvette in the store. And he heard about the bet. And it got around the Buckhead area that Luther's going to put his Corvette through the front door. And they said, what time? So we said, about midnight, because we've got to rearrange all these boxes. And so there was a curb about this high, and you couldn't get the Corvette over the curb. So uh, the bar owner across the street built me a big ramp, you know, bricks and things, angled it so I could get through there, you know. And uh, so the assistant manager, uh, when the time came for the event, there was about 150, 200 people hanging around, you know, watching. And, uh, yeah, my wife was there, and uh, Roy Rogers, my good friend with Peavy, been my friend for years. 
he was always there when things went crazy at the store. So anyway, we'd had a few drinks and, and uh, I'm doing figure eights out in front of the store and I'm gonna run it through there and I got the ramp ready and everybody's way up, run her in. So ooh, I take off through there and it jams in the, <laughs> jams in the door. Knocked out six huge pane glass windows in the front of the store, cracked the foundation. The Corvette wouldn't go through because that space I lost on either side. Jammed in there, so I floorboarded. I said, I'm getting this sucker in there. And it wouldn't go, and the tires were spinning, smoking, catching on fire, and all that. Ooh, I'm going to quit that, you know, so I kind of got it out of the door and it just kind of died on the street, and it was a total loss. And everybody's clapping, you know. I kind of got egg on my face. <laughs> I didn't really think anything about it because we used to do crazy things. And uh, the next day we had a guy who wrote an article in the Atlanta paper called Ron Huspeth of the things that are happening around town. And uh, Jimmy Carter was president and I'd met Jimmy on a few occasions. He used to come in their store. He was governor of Georgia. Sorry, Jimmy. But <laughs> and Jimmy was the governor of Georgia and I voted against you, but I love you. But anyway, uh, so... Uh, the article, the head article that was up, up there was uh, Jimmy Carter, President of the United States, is seen the Manuel Malouf's Tavern in Little Five Points eating a cheeseburger and drinking a beer. Oh my God, Jimmy Carter's drinking a beer? The President, Christian leader of the world? <laughs> and George Luther of Rhythm City Music totals his Corvette and runs it through the first to the store and damage it to, to no telling how much money. So here I'm, I'm in the same, you know, bit black italics with Jimmy Carter. And I said, that's pretty interesting. I didn't think anything about it. And actually about a year ago, my attorney friend for 40 years sent me this old brown copy. He said, George, I thought you might want this. Sent me the page. And, and I didn't know I was on top of Jimmy. I made headlines over Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> And we had a radio station in Atlanta, WERD, and I was selected weirdo of the week. <laughs> and my daughter was called in for counseling at school, wanted to know if her daddy was crazy. And uh, I think we got on about 6 o'clock in the morning, we was sweeping up glass, and we had a glass cup, we had to come 30 miles to board the windows up, we couldn't get anybody to do it. It was a really crazy night. So I've had to tell that story one million times, if not more. And... Uh, Next day, I get a call from Tom Jumper Chevrolet, who was the big Corvette dealer. He must have had 200 and stuff. Uh, Mr. Luther, please. I said, this is he. So said, is this the crazy guy that ran his, tried to run his Corvette through the front door last night? He said, I guess I'm the one. <laughs> he said, well, we want to sell you a Corvette. And said, we'll sell it to you for our factory costs. I said, well, I've heard that before. He said, no, I'm serious. Our General Motors will send you a copy of the invoice floor plan. And if you'll let us replace that for you, I'll use you for advertising. I said, oh, okay. Send it on down. I want a maroon with the gray leather interior. This was 87. We just got one in. But the boss wanted to keep it, but okay, you can have it. So he drove it down. So it's my car. <laughs> so uh, it was an interesting story. And it goes on and on, but ended up I broke my leg. I slept on some ice in Atlanta grocery store at night at 12 o'clock going home. Broke my leg. Had it in the cast up to my hip. I couldn't get in the Corvette, so I had to sell it. So I put an ad in the classified section of the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. And I kept security guards for late 60s uniform because it was just better. It's a tax write off and your safety, and we had a lot of different kinds of clientele, you know. And, and uh, we'd had a couple attempted holdups and everything. We said, that's over with. So we heard security back in the late 60s. And, uh, but anyway, I had a security guard and uh, used to use Atlanta policemen or DeKalb County, depending which store it was. Always kept one. Anyway, I, I had that car for six months, broke my leg, put an ad in the paper. I got a call from Pensacola, Florida. And the girl says, uh, uh, what's your name, sir? I said, uh, George Luther. She said, uh, see, you got your brand new Corvette in here. It's only got a few thousand miles on this. And, and what's wrong with it? I said, you're selling it for, it was something like 26, 28,000 when I paid for it. I said, broke my leg, can't get in it. Um, so I'm just going. She said, oh, me and my boyfriend work for Florida Power and, my, and Light Company. She said, we'll drive up there Saturday and look at it. I said, we, that's the exact car we're looking for. 
Pensacola, 300 miles away. I said, oh no, you don't have to drive up here. Uh, I'll be glad to have my security guard drive down there and let you look at it because that price, you can't beat it. And it's brand new. She said, you would do that? And I said, certainly. I mean, when you see the car, you're going to buy it. And she said, well, we'll be glad to come up. But see, I didn't want her to come to Atlanta and look in the yellow pages. She had a boyfriend because there's only about a thousand of them for sale. <laughs> you knew and used, and they don't want to pay 28000 They probably want to pay fifteen to twenty. So I knew I won't lose the sale, you know. So I said, no, we'll bring it to you. So uh, the security guard drove it down the next day. He says, bingo, we're in the uh, credit union getting the money, and I'll be back on the next uh, uh, Delta flight to Atlanta. <laughs> Came back with a check. So uh, it was just a lot of those kind of crazy stories, you know, with yours. Well, I had sold out to Guitar Center, and I had made Longbook Key, Florida, my permanent residence, but I still had some property in Atlanta. And my next door neighbor, I had this one house for 10 years, vacant. I kept thinking, someday I'm going to remodel it. It's on three acres behind the country club. And she said, George, we really don't like that house empty next door for 10 years. She said, my wife had died. She said, if you ever want to sell it, I know this beautiful woman, the next three over, can sell it for you. She owns a real estate company. And she said, let me give you her name. She said, in fact, she's single. And you're saying, well, y'all would make a great couple. Here's the number calling. I said, oh, OK, well. So I came back to Florida and said, you know, I think I will sell that house. So I couldn't find her number, so she ended up calling me. And I wasn't going to come back to Atlanta because I did consulting for about 10 years, eight or 10 years after I sold out the Guitar Center. And uh, so uh, I just got back to Florida. And after talking to her for three days, three hours each day, I said, you know what? I'm coming back to Atlanta next Tuesday, Wednesday. I wasn't going to come back for a month, but I liked your voice on the phone. I said, I'd like to take out to dinner, and we'll discuss out of my house. So I came back, and we went out and met her for lunch, and I said to myself, I'm going to marry this lady. And he was dating eight women at the time, so I was the lucky woman. Yeah. Yeah, but I said when she came out of the door, I said, wow. So I tell everybody, I said, I married number one for her money. Number two for looks. No, number one for looks, number two for money. But now this real estate market is suffering. I just married for looks. <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, you tell me when to start because I got a pretty funny story for you. So, um, another story back in our Buckhead store. And uh, uh, we kept a lot of inventory in the back stock room from the warehouse that we moved a lot of, like DX7 Yamahas back in those days, and the keyboard, and we, our mail order was doing real well. And we had a drum department in the back of the store, it was about 100 feet away, I guess. And we had a great big gong up real high, and then we had shells, and we had tambourines, and, and drum heads, and all the stuff, big gong over these things. And uh, one day a salesman came in and said, George, look what I bought. And he reached in the pocket and had a little Derringer pistol, a little six shot. It took a little 22 caliber long rifle so, and a little revolver. And I said, oh, that's cute. I said, where did you get that? He said, well, I got it in a pawn shop because he used to sell guitars to pawn shop. He was one of the cheap, you know, those kind of guitars. He said, they had it in for $75. And I bought it. I said, oh, man. I said, well, get me one. He said, well, I just saved this one for when I get it, and I'll get another one. I said, great. So I put it in my pocket. Roy Rogers comes in that night, who then was the, I think he was Yamaha rep, or B&J rep, I've forgotten. And uh, Roy's here for the convention. He's a great guy. He's a PB rep. So Roy came in, and um, I said, Roy, look what I bought today. And so he said, oh, my God, Joey. said, that's cute. said, but... What are you going to hit with that thing? He said, you couldn't hit the side of the barn. I said, well, you see that gong back there? And it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We had a lot of customers in the store. I said, I can't hit the center of that gong with this thing. He said, no, you couldn't. I said, went bang. And it went conk, and it hit the, and it just flattened it because it wouldn't go through that gong. Hit the floor, tink, 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 tink. And I said, damn. He said, you shot that thing, and you're still open, and the noise, and everybody looked around like, what's going on? And I didn't even think anything about it. And I didn't even look at the gong, and it hit about two inches off center, you know, because it had big rounds. So, hey, that was a pretty lucky shot, you know. So the guys, after we closed, I said, George said, can we bring our gun in tomorrow and shoot the gong? 
Oh, yeah, okay, I guess, you know, after 8 or 9 o'clock, you know, we'll have a few beers. And so they were coming in with 22s and 30, you know, twos and things. And then the guns started getting bigger and 45s. And, and once a week, we'd have this shoot-off to this gun. So uh, we had Marty Kahn, who ended up being, I think, national sales manager for PV, and he was a PV rep when he left me. But Marty put on all his Vietnam gear and came one night, put his headphones on, had this 45, you know, and he's, you know, about 20 of us. Okay, Marty, Marty said, so I'm gonna blow it away. And Marty, kapow! <laughs> Hit the, went through the wall. Kapow! Went through the wall, about five shots. He has goggles on and all, like he's ready for combat, you know. Mar and Roy Rogers and I are dying. I said, Marty, let me see that gun. Maybe something wrong with your gun. Like, and I wasn't even looking. I'm like, bang! Bullseye. Everybody hit the floor laughing. <laughs> Marty looked at me, takes the gun, put his back in the case, takes his headphones off, gets his cam camouflage off, and stomps out. It was so funny. So these guys were bringing their guns. They got where they bring these powered bow and arrows and shooting with bow and arrows. So there's a lot of holes in the wall. So um, here's the story. Back behind that wall, and I wasn't thinking, we would keep a dozen or two dozen DX7s because we'd run to 8, 10, 12 a day, you know, that one mile. I shipped a DX7 to a guy out in Oklahoma, and we became first name basis on the phone, you know. And he said, George, I got my DX7 today. He said, there's something rattling around in it. I said, well, you know, it's got like about eight screws on the bottom. If you'll take that off and shake it out, sometimes they get a little factory solder in there, and you definitely want to get that out of the cross PC board and short it out and damage it. And call me back and let me know what's happening. He said, okay, because I didn't really want him to ship it back and have to ship it. Alone. So he called back in a few minutes and said, George, I said, I just opened this thing up and said, it's got a slug in it. I said, what? <laughs> let me call you back. So I went back there, and I had about 25 riddled keyboards at a loss of about fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar cost, where these guys couldn't hit the gun, they could shoot through the wall because it was just sheetrock, and they were riddled and riddled. And we had to open them all up the next day, and every one of them was riddled. We had to toss them out. You know, we lost. So we banned guns from the store. No more, no more uh, target shooting. So uh, it was that kind of crazy thing that went on, you know, and. and uh, I don't know, we had fun, you know, we just had to have fun and we worked hard and a lot of pressure and guys with arguments, and, cool it guys, you know, we'll have a beer after work and everything's going to be cool, okay. Oh, early on, we had these uh, three foot by three foot squares, green and white towel. So but there was a sporting goods store down the store, a friend of mine. So we used to get all these little arguments between the seven. So we had a deal. We'll go down and get the boxing gloves, and you guys got to stand in the square. And the first guy that knocks the other guy out wins the argument. And that went on for months. So, and I was usually the one sitting there fighting myself, you know, and so if I could knock this guy out, I won. If he knocked me out, he won. And uh, then we'd go back down the street, take the, we should have bought our own boxing gloves, but we didn't. But, Guys started getting damaged, a bloody nose, and you know, so we had to stop that one. But it was that kind of crazy thing, craziness that went on in our store. Into arm wrestling. Arm wrestling. We got into arm wrestling. I got into weightlifting for about seven, eight years. There was a bodybuilding place across the street, and these guys would come in and get changed for the meter, and they'd see me all puffed up, and they say, "You work out across there?" I said, "No, got my own gym at home." And they said, man, you look good. I said, uh, I need uh, change for a $5 bill for the parking man. I said, well, I just arm wrestled you, double or nothing. And they said, you will? Because <laughs> they knew they could beat me, and they couldn't beat me. But we'd always go through the glass <coughs> and crack the glass, and then go down and have all the boss pedals and everything and glass in them. So we had a standing order with the glass company two blocks down the street for this top glass of these counters. They were like two foot by about four foot, and we just call them up, say, send another top up, you know, we'd get an order one or two a week where we'd go through them, and where we'd be arm wrestling all of our elbows and cut up, you know, so we had to give that one up. But that was a funny, <laughs> old funny story. Uh, I'll tell you, maybe I shouldn't tell this one, but one of our boys that worked on for us, Jeff Fortin, 
nicknamed him Homie because he gained a lot of weight and uh, great guy. He's still in the industry. He's now the national sales manager for Lisa's, Jeff Horton. And he and my son are great friends, and just probably 45, 6, something like that. So uh, Jeff got real heavy, and he's a great bass player and everything. Great voice, and he used to be the coordinator for Atlanta area for uh, uh, the guy that does a, a promote uh, for the motivational speakers. The young guy, what was his name? Can't remember. But anyway, this guy had the positive attitude, real positive. He'd get everybody going, and he didn't have any sales ability. But I liked him, and I hired him. He became one of our top salesmen over the years. Anyway, he started wearing these real baggy clothes because he got fat just with elastic in them. And, you know, they'd stretch in them and uh, had that uh, homie look, you know, like the clown. So they nicknamed him Homie, even though he's a good looking guy, he was heavy. So my son and him were friends and they used to play jokes on each other. So my son would run up behind him and occasionally pull his pants down. You need to have his old polka dot shorts on, you know, and everybody died laughing. Well, one night we closed up and homies and all of my guys had to help unload the trucks at night when they come in from the warehouse and restock. And homies at the front door. And the door was locked because it was eight or nine o'clock. So uh, he had his arms full of boxes and the door was locked. And customers out there wanted to come in because they thought we were still in there working. So my son slipped up behind him real quick and he didn't realize there were customers there trying to get in. Pulls his Pants down real quick. Homie had played a trick on my son. He didn't have any underwear on. <laughs> and he's standing there with these boxes, and the customer's going. <laughs> you know, so they left him, and Homie just standing there in the middle with these boxes, with this, and everybody's dying laughing. And they said, the joke wasn't on Homie, it was on JR, my son. And he was George, and they called him JR. Said, because when he pulled his pants down and he was naked underneath, Said his eyes got that big and he almost passed. I said, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these are just some of the crazy things that uh, we used to do. And, uh, the one thing I've heard the most is that I bought my first guitar from George mm. and, and that it was all fun. And they missed the store so much because he made it fun. It was stressed out. But lots of fun. Tell the story of throwing the guitar back and forth when you got stressed. Um, <laughs> um, Scott Floyd, who's now the JBL, um, Southeastern District Manager and Sales Rep, he used to work for me. He's a good guy, worked for me for years. Uh, he was working as a salesman in that Buckhead store, and uh, the big store up there. And we had a Flying V guitar. I think it was a Dean up on the wall. It was something that was not moving and we wanted to sell it bad. I think it was twelve hundred dollars retail and of course cost was six hundred. So uh, this boy used to come in all the time and looking at weird guitars. He never bought anything. He was a pretty good picker but he just never bought anything. So he came in one day and said, I want to buy that guitar up there. I said, Great, we'd like to sell it. We'll sell it to you for eight hundred dollars. He said, Oh no. And Scott came to him and said, he wants to give you $200 for it. I said, $200? So I said, Scott, get the guitar down and uh, let me look at it. Because we had $600 in it. So the guy's over there, well, are you going to sell it for $200 or not? I've got to look at it. So Scott, Scott was about 10 feet away. I said, toss me that guitar. I want to look at it. He said, toss it. He threw it to me. So Scott tossed it. I caught it. And I said, oh. Here, Scott, what do you think? I, we want to move this guitar here. And I said, uh, back up about five, ten feet. And Scott backed up about five, ten feet. He said, what? I said, take a look at this guitar. What do you think? Can we sell that for $600? And Scott, he's throwing this guitar around. And the customer's right here in the middle of it. And Scott, I said, Stop. Scott, look at it. You think we can sell it for $600? Said, he, he, he said, you want me to see? I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, well, Throw it back to me, I want to see it again. So I moved back about five or 10 feet. Now we're getting further apart tossing this guitar. And after we got about 30, 35 feet away, the price had come down to $400. The guy says, I'm gonna give you $200, George. I said, 
Scott, let me look at that guitar one more time. It must not be as good a guitar as I thought it was. Toss it, and the guy's looking at Scott, and I said, Scott, where you go? Hi. Huh? You know, Scott, throw it away. Oh, my head. Steve Knight crashed, and I went and looked at it, and the neck's off of it, and the strings are hanging there. <laughs> I went and picked it up and pieced it in the hand. The guy said, you're right. This guitar is only worth $200. It's yours. The guy said, you are crazy, man. I'm leaving, never coming back. So he took off out the door. So we hung the guitar up in the center of the guitar with walls full of them with the strings drooped down. Well, special price, didn't scratch sale, $200. <laughs> Somebody finally bought it for 100 or something. They figured they could put it back together, you know. Uh -huh. But, uh, There's a thousand stories like that. I got to tell you one is a little racial, don't mean anything by it. I had a lot of great black friends. A uh, black attorney used to work for me, he was an assistant district uh, being, being. attorney I know, for Fulton County. Great guy. Anyway, I used to get these calls from Jose Williams, who was, say, Brother George, uh, my boys come in all the time and said, you got some black boys working for you, but Joe, we don't think you have enough. Said, uh, we want you to hire some more. I said, well, sure, send them on in. Let me interview them, man. You know, I'm great friends of mine, musicians. So um, um, this one black guy that worked for me, he was an attorney. He worked for me on Saturdays, selling recording gear and keyboards. He was really good. And so uh, we invited him to all our Christmas parties, you know, early on. And uh, he would come to a Christmas party. And I happened to have a picture of him kissing my first wife on the cheek, but it looked like he was kissing her lips and somebody blown lip to eight by 12, nine by 12. And uh, we kept that picture over the years and here's this guy kissing my wife and then we were having fun. So every time Jose Williams would call me up and threaten me with the picket around the store because I didn't have my quota of uh, you know, people working there, uh, my son would go grab that picture tape it up on the front door with a big say, uh, notice underneath it. Picture of new owners. <laughs> <laughs> and Brother Jose would call me, hey, Mr. Johnson, that was real funny. So I love you, man. So, you know, now we, you know, we just want to check and see how you're doing. And, you know. So poor old Jose, he went to the happy hunting ground. But <laughs> uh, anyway, there's just so many stories. It's, we could stay. We could stay here all day. <laughs> and some of them involve selling equipment. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Some of that. Something to do with the industry. Yeah. <laughs> they say, "Are you here for the money?" I said, "No, I'm just here for the change." <laughs> so, uh, you know, my playing is funny because I finally got where I can play decent. You know, I'm not great, but I can play decent. And uh, so my friend said, George, you, you play a lot of gigs mm, once in a while? You know, we played two or three nights. We do it for fun. We don't do it for money more, Sarah and myself. He said, well, how much do you charge for a gig? I said, oh, you mean for a paying gig? Because I don't charge for gigs. You know, I do it for fun. He said, well, if you're going to charge, what would you charge for uh, you know, a big gig? I said, uh, for one performance? He said, yeah. I said, 200000 I said, 200000 I mean, you mean for one night? I said, yeah, one night. I said, would well, you work much? I said, never got a job, but if I ever get one, I'm going to break the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. You know, we have a great time, and we stay. We keep our foot in the door with the music industry and all of our friends, and we know what's going on. We try to keep it, and they call me, and I call them, and we're just buddies and uh, fraternity. You know, we love each other. And... Uh, so we're going to have this group tomorrow night, and we've narrowed it down to 50, 60 people. I mean, as many can come as they want to. But for uh, dinner, we've got, I think, set for 60 over at the Merchant's Restaurant. Everybody come. <laughs> you, you might have to pay for your drinks, but uh, anyway, it's going to be fun. And, uh, yeah, I know how you feel about Guitar Center now. I love them. <laughs> How did you feel about them when they first came out? I love them. They were always nice guys. You know, we'd talk at the shows, and um, uh, it was, you know, I, I kind of held them at bay for years because they kept wanting to come into Atlanta when they expanding, and 
they would call up the suppliers that they knew that knew me and they'd say, is George Luther really as crazy as we hear is because we hear that he says, and I was going to do this, uh, he'll open up a store across the street from all of our big stores in the United States. And uh, they said, yeah, he's that crazy. He will try it. Because I said, look, I don't care about making any money. I just want to have fun. And you make my life fun. You give me something, to get up, reason to get up in the morning, go at it, because I worked 18 hours a day. So I kind of put the word out, let him come on into Atlanta, and then I'm going to go to Hollywood and put my store across the street, and I'm going to go to Dallas, and I'm going to go to all the New York, and, and we're just going to see who can survive the price cutting game. I'll get a job at McDonald's to eat hamburgers. And, and so they went to the friends and said, George serious? And, yeah, George pretty serious. Said, you don't want to do that. And so um, we came, kind of became friends. And I, and, I, and I took my attorney out to California once and went and saw a lot of manufacturers with a store opening plan to do that very thing. In case they came to Atlanta, I would have done that. But thank God they, they opted to buy me out. And I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the reason they knew I would do it, um, years ago, I couldn't play guitar. You know, back in the 60s, I started playing a little guitar, and, and I was on page three. And um, so I started guitar lessons upstairs, you know, in some rooms I've been in, in my first location. And uh, the word got out to Lockheed, um, where they're making airplanes, and they had about 35,000 employees at the time and uh, that they were looking for a guitar teacher for DLERC, which is a Georgia Lockheed Recreation, you know, corporation, for the employees and their families to take guitar lessons. I said, I can teach that. So we had a recruiting, recruiting night one night, and we had about 500 people sign up. You know, men and women and their kids. So we started with three groups. We started off with a beginner's group, an uh, intermediate group, and a professional, you know, advanced. So it was beginning class, media, intermediate class, and, and professional, uh, advanced class. And my, I took my real good guitar players and let them teach the intermediate and the advanced, and one of them helped me teach the uh, beginners. But I had two beginning classes myself that I ended up with about 150, 200 per class, and I would teach uh, one or two nights a week and it was always full. And this was back in the late 60s. And uh, everybody showed up with a $10 guitar. You know, and they were all out of tune. They were from, you know, Radio Shack, or what even Radio Shack back then, and Montgomery Wards and Sears Roebuck and, and some of those stores, you know, in business and True Tone, stuff like $10 and strings that high. And I'd run around trying to tune everybody's guitar real quick, you know. And uh, then I had a big chalkboard, so I would draw out, you know, the guitar fingerboard and put the circles where I wanted the fingers to go. And I had my shirt and tie on and everything on it. Big stage and big auditorium, microphone, big chalkboard. And there was a piano up there, and I was playing piano. So my goal was to get him to learn to strum the chords to one song, Little Rock Getaway. Do 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 like that, and when they got through all these chords, they learned about twelve chords, just not E, A, and B seven. And so I'd go tune all the guitars, and if you've ever heard 150 guitars out of tune strumming at one time, you know. And after the first week or two, I took tons of music books and pitch pipes and strings and all this, and it was a dollar for lesson. And they would sign in at the door, and then when they left at night, they paid their dollar and we checked the name off, make sure they paid. So we weren't there for the money, we were there for the change. That's what reminded me of it. <laughs> but my goal was not the money, it was to sell them a guitar. A guitar. So the 330 Gibsons had come out. A little semi hollow body, double pickup, and the 335s came out. And my goal was to sell everybody a 330 or a 335. I bought hundreds of them. I had to rent a building behind me, the street behind me. I rented a storefront building just to stock 330 to 335s. And I would tell them. Uh, I work in a music store. I wouldn't tell them I owned it. And I would say, um, 
we can give you a special discount for Lucky if you want to buy one of these. These are great guitars because you can play it acoustically and you can hear it, or you can play it electric, and it's got great action. We'll set them all up. Or you can buy them, you know, other stores in town had them then. And I said, we're going to give you the best price. And boy, in the end of six weeks, 80% of them had a 330 or 335 strum. And a lot of those guys that were in my class back there, I mean, I started getting a little better because I was having to get better to stay ahead of these guys. You know, my fingers were getting so I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, a lot of the guys got into the music business, and uh, Music Mart was one of them. So what happened with Music Mart, this guy was a salesman with uh, Westinghouse. And he started taking lessons at Lockheed because he had a relative that worked there and he could get in. So he started coming to the store and he said, George, this is back in the 60s, he said, I want to open up a music store. I'm tired of selling white goods, appliances. He said, can you help me? I said, yeah, I like this guy. You know, so I showed him how to buy some used stuff at pawn shops and buy this, that, and other. And opened up a little store out in Smyrna, Georgia, in a little house downtown, you know, across from railroad tracks. And he became very, you know, very successful. And he talked to this big old clunking boy in the movement in Nashville. He said, you know what? He said, you're a great songwriter. And this boy had a big furniture store out in Smyrna, a freestanding, you know, like 50, 60,000 square foot square foot store. And he said, let's become partners, this guy tells us, other guy. And so they became partners and they made that a music, big music store. And they, they were pretty successful. They had a big basement full of merchandise. They had a little 500 watt radio station put in there and called the Music Mart. And uh, so uh, I used to sell Don Howard some strings and picks and things wholesale, you know. And, and occasionally I'd sell him some off-breed guitars and things and help him. And so we were kind of friends. And uh, so I got a trip to uh, Japan and Korea for the drums. And I've forgotten who the manufacturer was, but uh, I, could, I never took any of these trips. I was too busy. I couldn't leave my business. And so I sent one of my drum guys. And uh, his wife, he just got married on the, their honeymoon on my trip. So what happened, that dealer was over there, and uh, he hired this guy on the trip to come to work for him, paying half of what I was fanning. So uh, he had keys to the store. So he came back from the trip 10 days later, and uh, I got a call from the camera store, and the store said, George said, you got a ton of people out front, and this, the store's closed. What's going on? I said, oh, I'll be right down. Took off, got down the store. So we go looking for this guy, and he came back the first day, cashed his payroll check, and never cashed his check in five years. And I thought that was unusual, and uh, I had the police go out and look at his apartment. He wasn't there. I thought maybe something had happened to him. So in the afternoon, a salesman comes over um, into the store, a rep. He says, guess where I saw so-and-so today? I said, where? He said he's worked behind the counter over at the Music Mart. He said they hired him. I said, what? I haven't talked to him. The guy, like, this goes back to 80. Four eighty-five. I said, you gotta be kidding. It made me so mad at my friend over there that helped get into the business. I said, he's got, it. he's bye-bye, he's gone. And they said, well, you're gonna have some old store across the street from him. I'm gonna sell it cost, I'm gonna put him out. And uh, so I had a boy working for him, he had a, a real estate license. I said, you go over there and find me a piece of property next door across the street. I don't care what it costs, and I'm gonna buy it. Okay, he called me back later today and said, bingo. I said, what do you got? He said, well, the guy that left you, he's wearing a brown tie with a green polka dot. And he said, I'm looking at him from where I'm standing and I'm in this uh, business over here. It's a converted house. They sold leather goods. And uh, he said, the woman says she wants to get out of this business. She's a retired school teacher and she didn't mean to get into it. Her daughter got into it. She said, come over here. So I went over there and I bought the building. I bought the lot next door from somebody else. Put a big bulldozer up against the building about 10 days later, two bulldozers, because there's a big hollow place over here. And so I called up D.H. was the guy's name. That was, that was his initials, he's dead now. And I said, uh, hey, Don, take a look out your window. There's something interesting going on. Hey, George, is that you? I said, that's me, take a look. And I was on the other phone, I said, go, guys. And so these bulldozers pull up to the house, and I had the permits on. I said, "Go!" And they, and they push this whole house over down in this hole. 
and he's got this whole sales crew. Now he's got about 30 people working for him. He's big, you know, what's going on? And then I had this big sign right that said, future home of goodbye music. And I had a big hand going, <laughs> you know, and you go like this. And so bulldozed it off, and later in the afternoon, it was a football field. <laughs> and he called me, George, George, he said, what are you trying to do? I said, nothing. You know, <laughs> you ought to take another trip to Japan. And he said, I heard you go up in the music store. He said, you're just trying to scare me. I said, Don, I don't want to scare you. You're my friend. See you, Don. Keep. Six months later, I had this beautiful store called American Music sitting across the street. And uh, Music Mart had themselves well established, and people never looked that direction. When they'd come down this busy street, they always pulled the Music Mart. So we put a big PA system out front, and we had wireless microphones, <laughs> and, that was a, and we had it well stocked. Um, anybody driving a 72 Chevrolet Green with mud flaps in it can buy for 50% off today at American <laughs> Discount Music. And they're looking, where did that come from? I never saw that store before. It was like <laughs> overnight, you know. And he'd run over there and say, what's going on? And, hey, man, how you doing? You and so I worked with the guys over there for a couple of months and you know, get them acting my sales crew. And I said, 50% off, what do you want? I'm a drummer, oh man. So he went across the street and he was gonna buy some cymbals and things. He came and said, they gonna give me a dime off over there. I said, well, 50% off. So he buys and then everybody pull up there for about a month. You know, we'd, and so the police came in, a detective or somebody with a order from the city said, you're violating the, um, you're violating the noise order. So you can't put these PA systems outside. He said, okay. So we opened up double doors and we had bullhorns from inside. So we'd give it to them with the bullhorn. <laughs> then it came down a week or two later with another notice. You're violating the bullhorn or the ordinance, something they concocted. Because some of these detectives and cops bought their equipment with the music mark. Well, they eventually all became my friends. So anyway, um, the owner of the store wouldn't play the game. And so my manager called me and said, George, we haven't got to sell 50% off. So I said, we can sell 20% off, and we're still going to get the deal. I said, no, don't want to do that, man. So 30% is the least we're going to give off and up to 50%, whatever it takes to make that deal. So over the years, you know, they lasted longer than I thought, but a few years later they went. Oh, we changed the name of it from uh, Goodbye Music because my first uh, manager there was a big rep in the business, and he's still out there, so I won't mention his name. And uh, he's a really nice guy. We met one time, and he came down from St. Louis. And uh, he said, George, that name, Goodbye Music, kind of sounds like sour grapes. I said, hmm, probably. <laughs> he said, well, do you think we ought to name it something else? I said, well, we can name it American Music, you know. Later we could say American Discount Music or something. He said, oh, that would work. So that was the reason I changed the name to American Music, really for him, because I like that. And every time we made a sale, this big hand was going to wave <laughs> across the street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so funny. And my guys got the voice quarters out that Christmas, you know, the sound like chipmunks, you know. Uh, rock around, rock around, Christmas tree, Christmas tree, and like harmony or whatever it is, and jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell, and all the song. And they made one, um, have yourself a happy holiday Christmas to the guys across the street with the chipmunk songs. And, the, <laughs> and uh, so we had them call them, I had them all stand out the sidewalk. And then we're talking about the height of the Christmas business. And the guy that left me and went to work, they all wore ties and you know, shirts and everything. And some of my guys did, but my guys always dressed like that. I had a dress code too, but not that. And so uh, the guy that left me, after we got through singing the Christmas songs to him with the chipmunk, our version of it, he turns around, and by then it's a big crowd for him. You know, like, what's going on? He pulls his pants down and moons us across the street. Well, the news media was there. <laughs> they proceeded to get sued across the street because this guy pulled his pants down and showing his ass. <laughs> so it was just fun. It was just fun. Uh, but we did. And so anyway, that's the reason the story got around to GC. 
yes, George will do that. He will probably open up a store across from you. So they kind of checked it out and said, hmm, you know, so I kind of held them off for a while, you know. So I really didn't want to go out and expand. I was doing all the business I wanted to do, out my locations, the mail order and everything I had going. And so we got together on the price of it. And my wife had been sick and I really wanted to spend time with her. So uh, I got a big grin on my face one day when they made me an offer. Okay. <laughs> So we consummated the deal, and they were very nice to me, and uh, kept me on as a um, consultant for a while, you know, so I could continue my insurance. And my first wife had, had some health issues and wanted to keep the insurance. And it was good for them because I had a two-year no-compete. So as long as they kept me on as a consultant, which I didn't do much consulting with them, I would occasionally go out there and they didn't take my advice on anything. <laughs> they have no way of doing business. And, uh, but uh, uh, they kept me on it, kept me another two years out from being able to open up, you know, as a competitor. So I kind of got used to the retired lifestyle. Didn't I ever want to go back in business anyway? <laughs> but they've been great. They have great people. Love them. So uh, when you have a few more hours, uh, we can sit down and tell you some more things. <laughs> we'll do a part two. George, yeah. I really appreciate your time. Well, you we we enjoyed it, and uh, hope I didn't say too many crazy things and <laughs> act like a bumbling idiot because I, I considered myself a good businessman. I got a degree in, in Emory in the business school, four years, and uh, once I taught them everything I knew in the business school at Emory, they kicked me out. That was a funny story when I was in college. I wore my hair long, not this long, but long by those days. And uh, you'd have 100 people in the class of math 101, whatever class it was, and somebody would come up, a runner, and hand the professor a note at the end of the class. Mr. Luther, uh, would you come up here after the class, please? And I'd go down and say, uh, Mr. Luther, you have a letter here from the dean's office. They want you know, something, they want his envelope, please. Report to the dean's office at two o'clock for a meeting with Dean Walensky, whatever his name was, Dean Smith. So sat down because they kind of had a dress code at Emory, you know, about the hair and everything. Uh, Miss Luther said um, we're getting complaints from professors and some students that you wear your hair too long. Said, would you tell us why you wear your hair so long? I said, well, I'm a musician, and musicians wear their hair a little long. It wasn't down here then. That was like. 54, I started in 58. And they said, well, would you kind of trim a little bit? I said, well, what do you plan? I said, I play different things, but my real desire is to be a bass singer in a gospel group, and they all have long, wavy hair. And he said, well, trim it, you know, so, okay. So, you know, I'd never get it trimmed, and, you know, just a little bit. So about six to eight weeks later, I'd get, I'd see a runner come in with the envelope, Mr. Luther, Maybe I've been in English class, been in them. Uh, Dean wants to see you. Okay, I go. I knew it was about Mr. Luther. Have you been trimming your hair? Yes, sir. I have been trimming it. <laughs> so I never trimmed my hair. So it was funny. So uh, there's just too many stories to tell. Because <laughs> one thing reminds me of another. You know. He's yeah. always known for his hot cars. Even back at Emory days, he had the hottest car. Well, I, had, I did have a race car um, in the uh, Peach Bowl in Atlanta. It was a quarter mile old, dirt, and that's where a lot of NASCAR got started. Mm -hmm. And I had number 77, we had a Chevy Coupe that I bought, and we painted up and ran it every Friday and Saturday night. It was great every time. We had 10, 15 times people show up. Rhythm City Special, black, silver letter, number 77. Back then, the guys wear a football helmet and bib overall smoke. <laughs> Cigar and has a jar of moonshine, they'd be drinking for this, <laughs> racing them, wrecks here and wrecks there, you know, tires flying up over lights at night and everybody, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> so a lot of those NASCAR guys came out of that Peach Bowl in Atlanta. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, Jack Black and I became very good friends, him, the uh, big chain of Hickory Houses, and he was one of the three founders of the Atlanta 500 International Speedway down there where NASCAR, so he's an official with NASCAR, and he's a friend of ours to this day. And um, 
he was president of about 16 years, 18 years, but he was a big restaurant and all. He sold out, and retired. I lost track with Jack for about 25 years. And after Sarah and I met, uh, we were down in Florida at our house down there. I went to City Hall to get an absentee ballot so I could vote in the election that year. And I'd been looking for Jack, and uh, this nice looking lady comes out, and she's young. And she said, yes, sir, and I said, I'd like you to mail me an absentee ballot to Atlanta, Georgia, because I'm going to be out of town for lunch. She said, uh, yeah, and I said, you might know my husband, Jack Black. I said, I've been looking for Jack Black for years. That's your husband? She said, yeah, we got married about seven years ago. And it ended up, they lived four blocks from us. We became like that. She called him up on the phone. We're talking. We go out to eat the next night. We've been together like that. So since Sarah and I got married four years ago, and they're very good people, good friends of ours. So it's just, that's kind of unrelated to the music business. But, uh, it is related. It's not related. <laughs> Other stories. But um, used to do it all. And, and advertising, that was a good way to advertise on it because most uh, people, people in this NASCAR now are all levels of people, all income groups and everything. But back in those days, it was mostly blue collar. Everybody wanted to play guitar. You know, I knew Jerry Reed and all those guys, and those guys all came out the racetrack, you know, to see what Saturday night, Friday night, you know. So I had a lot of fun with it. One of my favorite stories, if you have time for one more, is when you had the played college days or back at the band. Oh, <laughs> oh. I was playing, I was playing, I had a band called the Continentals, uh, the Continental Jazz Men when I was in college. And in that band I was playing tenor sax and I would double the piano and go play the bass, play the bass, I had a good group and we finally had to change it from Continental Jazz Men because people didn't want to hear jazz or pop, so they wanted to hear rock and roll. So we just called ourselves the Continentals. And we played a lot of the college circuit, you know, University of Georgia, University of Tennessee, Alabama, Auburn, everything around Atlanta. So uh, I'd get calls occasionally from other bands who would want me to play with them or get my players to play with their bands. You know, if we weren't busy, they weren't busy, and we'd, you know, work, interface with other bands and stuff. So I got a call one night and I said, no, oh, I guess back in the early 60s. And this guy said, uh, George, he says, uh, I'm so and so and so and so. He said, playing out at the club. I said, he said, I hear you play saxophone pretty good. I said, yeah, it's all right. And he said, what are you doing Saturday night? I said, well, let me look and see. And he said, well, I'm, I'm not busy Saturday night. He said, well, why don't you come out and play with us Saturday night? I said, well, play, where are you playing? He said, we're playing out at the Longhorn Saloon out on Lakewood Avenue. Rough area. <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty rough area. You know, they played country music. And I said, well, okay. Uh, and it was paid practically nothing, 15 or 20 bucks back then, you know. So he said, don't wear any nice clothes. He said, you know. We all wear blue jeans and things. Okay, so I wore the worst clothes I had, and I went in, and I looked like I was going to Sunday school. <laughs> and all these pickup trucks and everything, there's sawdust all over the floor, and all the light was furnished by all these beer signs going around, and all the waitresses had two teeth. And <laughs> so they had a bass player, upright bass player, and you had a guitar player. I'm playing sax. Okay, guitar, bass, and sax. And um, bass, sax, yeah, and a drummer. And uh, so it was for us, me. And these guys were terrible. So during the first break, I'm sitting back here with the drummer at the table drinking a beer. And the other guys wanted away flirting with the two teeth waitress. And I said, Did you guys really use a sax player? I mean, I mean, I didn't tell you, you stink and you're lousy, but I'm thinking, you know, I got to play Stardust in, in F sharp because they could just play three chords in E, you know. And he said, yeah, we got a great sax player. I said, well, uh, how come he couldn't make it? And I said, well, he's running around with this uh, married uh, uh, woman, and her husband found out about it. And uh, he found out that he played saxophone at the Longhorn Saloon on Saturday nights. He's supposed to come in and shoot him tonight. I said, wait a minute. I'm the guy playing saxophone here tonight. Does he know what he looks like? He said, no, he just knows he plays saxophone at the Longhorn Saloon on Saturday night. I go up there and get my sax and put it in the case, you know, and trick it behind the old upright pen and put it in the gun and put my coat on. I'm, I'm hauling butt out of there. The singer catches me. He says, hey, George, where are you going? I said, you had me set up as a target to get killed tonight. He said, I'm out of here. You know, he said, 
No, man, he said, you got anything else you play? He said, you see, or you put your saxophone up. I said, well, I got a tambourine and harmonica, but I'm not playing with you guys. He said, well, I'll drag your microphone over the table and you can have a beard and play harmonica with us. Let's see how that goes. He talked me into it, so I sat there and played harmonica with my back to the band. I played <laughs> harmonica, you know, blues harp. So I got out of there and nothing happened. So he calls me up next Tuesday. He said, hey, George, he said, that was damn good. Uh, Saturday night, he said, can you play with us again Saturday night? I said, I'm not ever playing with you guys again. Are you kidding me? He said, I didn't want you to play sax. I wanted to play harmonica and beat tambourine. I said, well, tell me. What happened to sax player? Anything? He said, oh yeah, said he got caught Sunday afternoon. Said he had to jump out of his two-story apartment, broke both legs, and had police happened to be coming by and took him down to the great hospital. I said that could have been me. <laughs> that could have been me. We're in my music career. Don't call me. I'll call you. <laughs> but they actually came on later to be pretty big stars and made a little splash in Nashville. It was no funny. Kidding. Funny story. I'm not gonna tell you the name because you would know. Really? Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, uh, just the days have gone again. by the the fifties and sixties were the greatest in the seventies, you know. It'll never be the same. I mean not back like those days to me anyway, because I was involved in all that change, you know. Yeah. And uh, music was so dynamic and it was changing so fast and and uh, you just couldn't get enough product to sell, and it just was great, you know what I mean? You had the back door, out the front door, in the back door, out the front door, you know? And uh, it was uh, really good, and the Lord shined on me. And uh, I thought, God, you know, I'm being blessed here, you know? I don't deserve it, but thank you, God, you know? Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I never, I never, and not saying this bragging, I never had a slow day. And each day seemed like it was better than the day before. And, you know, it just worked. I don't know. You know, it was just really strange because I had other friends, they go through these recession times and they'd be licking their wounds, the stores would be going out of business. And I was just still saying they're doing business and never really realized a bad time, you know. And so I was just really blessed, and, you know. So that's kind of the story and I'll stick to it. <laughs> And I tell Sarah it's because of my mother's prayers. They didn't want me to uh, go into the music business, you know, when I was young. They said, no, you got to go to work for Woolworth. And musicians, they, they don't make any money, and you're going to starve to death, and don't lose all the money you saved, George. And, you know, I'm worried about you, and I'm going to pray for you. Pray for me. <laughs> so, that's what happened. <laughs> So they became very proud of me after I started doing some numbers, you know. So it worked for me. So, but anyway, I enjoyed coming and talking yeah, to well, you I and all my friends. And, Thank uh, you.